Good afternoon, everyone. I think we need to get going. My name is Janine Hicks, and I'm a lecturer in the School of Law and a member of the Navi Pillay Research Group, who is the host for today's discussion. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you on behalf of the Dean and the Head of the School of Law, Professor Manage Reddy, to part two of the Navi Pillay Research Group seminar series under the theme, Things Fall Apart, the Rule of Law in Unprecedented Times. Firstly, just to let you know who we are, the Navi Pillay Research Group is a collective of academics from within the School of Law. We seek to address critical emergent issues of race, class, gender, and disability in post-apartheid South Africa, primarily through research, but equally through law and policy reform interventions. This webinar series has been prompted by the recent challenges to the rule of law, the resulting impact on and implications this has had for our justice system, for good governance and for society generally. For those of you who missed our first part of our lecture series, which was titled The Rule of Law in Times of Crisis, this took place last week on the 28th of October, 2021. Our presenter was advocate Tembega Mugaitobi, um, who spoke on the complex interface between and web of relations between courts and judges on the one hand and the realm of politics, government and civil society on the other. If you missed this session, you can catch the recording through the web link, which was provided in the invitation to today's seminar. Um, and I'll, I'll post it in the Q&A um, for those of you who'd wish to catch up with that. But today's seminar under the theme, Unrest, Criminal Justice and Social Cohesion, has as its focus the recent unrest or uprising, primarily in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng, the looting, and the community response that has polarized many of our communities um, and what the impact this has been, what impact this has had on social cohesion within our communities. We've put together a panel of speakers who will prompt our discussion, which will be moderated by my colleague in the School of Law, Mr. Siabonga Sibisi. I am now happily going to hand over to Siabonga, who will introduce today's panel and get us going. We look forward to today's discussions. Thank you for joining us. Siabonga. Thank you. Thank you, Chanin, for the wonderful welcome. I will switch off my video since I have poor lighting where I am, and I'm hoping that everyone is able to hear me. Uh, this is a very wonderful day. It's bright in Durban and as well, but we have very uh, wonderful speakers who are energetic. Now, as a disclaimer, I must state that when we decided that the topic or the title of this session is going to be about the role of the rule of law in unprecedented times, we did not anticipate the election results. So these two, those two are unrelated. Now, without wasting uh, uh, much time since of the essence, I would like to start by some uh, housekeeping uh, uh, issues. You will see that at the bottom of the screen, there is that Q and A. Uh, if you have any question, you are urged to type it in there. And we also urge you to indicate the name of the speaker to whom the question is directed. Otherwise, any general idea sharings can go on the chat platform. Just to repeat once again, under the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, that is where you will type in the question, naming or identifying the speaker to whom it is directed. And on the chat platform, everyone to, is free to participate. Now we have a lineup of speakers, uh, three of them, and they will each address us for approximately 15 minutes. Once it's 15 minutes, I will advise the speaker of the time. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Professor Paulo Zulu, who is a director in the Morris Webb Race Relations Institute. Uh, Professor Zulu Dabezita is well experienced in issues of social cohesion. And for the purposes of today, he will address us of the social cohesion aspect relating to the unrest that occurred in July. Professor Zulu, the floor is yours, the visit. Thank you very much, moderator and colleagues. 
I decided to entitle my presentation, first of all, am I audible? Yes, you are audible, Prof. Great, thank you. I decided to entitle my presentation, An Anatomy of Social Cohesion After the July Lootings. And I say, Phoenix could have been any other place. And let me share this little presentation. Share screen, share. Uh -huh. I hope I don't have a problem trying to take us up and down. No, I don't. Right. My starting point is that failures in the civic functions of government lead to solidarities or to the solidification of primordial affiliations of family, tribe, ethnicity, and race. The genesis is that despite the transition to democracy, race relations in South Africa has always been tenuous, in spite of the constitutional pronouncements of a rainbow nation celebrating its nationhood in its diversity. Failures in governance have ensured that a nation state with a common civic culture has failed to emerge and develop among the diverse constituents of the rainbow nation, a nation only constitutionally and in name. Therefore, what happened in Phoenix during the July widespread lootings was no isolated incident. I refer to Phoenix because much ink was spent in reporting and analysis of the violence, which broke out in this predominantly Indian township, disregarding the fact that an overwhelming majority of the looters came from the African population, and that looting took place predominantly in large commercial centers. Those who commented on the Phoenix episode tended to put an accent on the racial question, which to me appeared to be a very simplistic approach, picking on the low hanging fruits as is usual in South African tendency to treat incidents in isolation with the result that we end up with the populist version of the narrative. Admittedly, Phoenix ostensibly presented as an Indian assault on the African. In reality, this was an epiphenomenon. And this will become clearer as I expand on this presentation. Now, what is the anatomy of Phoenix in, with regard to this issue? Phoenix happens to be adjacent to African residential areas of Wamashun, Duzuma, and Inanda, and is also on the transport route to townships in Verulam. This geographical location was to prove to be a tragic recipe for conflicting pursuits during the looting. What do, I, what do I mean by conflicting pursuits? Looters wanted to loot. Residents wanted to protect their properties and themselves. The reaction to the throwing of the first stone, to use the proverbial biblical expression, reflected the deep-rooted tensions arising from democratic South Africa's failure to address the racial architecture dating to the colonial and apartheid days. Phoenix therefore was not an isolated incident. What happened there could have happened in any location situated in a similar configuration. The July looting was a demonstration of factional politics in the African National Congress as the governing party in South Africa. Simply put, the factionalism reflects the competition over access to the state trough. The predatory factions are vying over the spoils. And here I rest my case. Now, this is as the cause of the looting. Practically, African residents from the surrounding areas went to loot warehouses and business, businesses located on the periphery of Phoenix. And in a frenzy, proceeded into Phoenix and looted and burned some small Indian businesses. For instance, a panel beating shop where in the process they burned the cars parked there for repairs. 
Naturally, Indian business owners mobilized to protect their properties and in the process armed themselves. Consequently, as could be expected in such circumstances, the situation took an ugly racial trajectory, resulting in the killing of over 30 Africans, some of whom had nothing whatsoever to do with the looting. It must be emphasized, however, that no African residents of Phoenix, qua residents, suffered this fate, nor were they in any way molested. Now, why did such a development take the course it did? And I refer here to South Africa's racial architecture. The first one is segregated sp spatial planning. Racialized residential planning resulted in racial enclaves, which militated against any development of common values, leading to harmonious relations between the separated races. Secondly, there was no social intercourse that could lead to normal trust and understanding between the races. Worse, the segregated residences reflected racial hierarchies as the physical appearance and quality of residential areas mirrored the superior inferior intentions of the architects of racism. The fact that Kalans were second class citizens, Indians third and Africans fourth or at the bottom of the racial hierarchy caused resentment regrettably, not only against whites but also among the subordinate races who regarded one another in that hierarchical, hierarchical order. Not surprisingly, when legalized racial barriers began to fall in the late 1980s, this ushered in an upward movement away from the townships into the suburbs. Consequently, there has been no migration residentially, or for that matter in schooling, from the white center to the black periphery. African children still continue to migrate, first into white and second to Indian and colored schools. All this has translated into feelings of superiority and arrogance on the part of the receiving or host races and into resentment on the part of the sending races as, reminds, as this reminds them of their social standing in the Commonwealth. It is these feelings arising from existential material conditions caused by failures in politics and government that cause undercurrents, tensions in the social space, and therefore constituting predisposing factors to incidents like Phoenix. There are tensions in the economic sphere. If the ownership of economic resources is racially biased, the value chain is equally biased. And this is evidenced in one, employment opportunities, including progression in the workplace. Two, pricing strategies, take discounts, for instance, where it is common cause that they, these have an upper class accent and the class lines have a racial hierarchy. Third, customer management. It is relatively easier to have a replacement item while servicing one's own if one belongs to the superior and therefore trusted race, or if one is of the same race as the owners of the servicing unit outfit, trust things with an upper class accent. Empirically, occupations in the marketplace are racialized. For instance, there is a predominance of Indians in the medical and accounting professions. Um, this is among the subordinate races and assurance which can be traced back or an occurrence which can be traced back into the history of the South African of South African racism. In the public sector, this has resulted in the dominance of the supply chain management by Indians as CFOs. It has become a common cause in African circles that when movement or when government tenders are advertised, Indian professionals will know of the adverts and specifications long before the public announcements of their opportunities. The result is skewed participation by Indians in government narrative work. In, inequality is a very racial architecture. That's my third observation. While South Africa records the greatest inequalities in the world, such inequalities are expressed not only in the Gini coefficient, but in the social and attitudinal fabric of society as well. 
Now, these are the predisposing factors which make happenings like Phoenix happen. Phoenix does, did not happen because there was visible hot hatred between Africans and Indians. But the existence of predisposing factors made it very easy that events like Phoenix took the course of that they did. In conclusion, given the brief sketch of the conditions that I have outlined above, it is no wonder that events in Phoenix shaped the way they did. The mutual distrust that exists between races is a powder keg with the potential to explore, to ex, 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 explode, explode, sorry, whenever a precipitant is activated. I want to emphasize, however, that the different races are not at each other's throats, but rather that the propensity to resort to primordial forms of affiliations is high where a civic culture does not exist. Social cohesion has not deteriorated despite the populist analysis of the July debacle. Rather, we have failed to embark on creative ways to nurture a South African nation. Social cohesion cannot be reduced to an event where we believe we are celebrating diversity by wearing material costumes. It is a process that requires both education and the removal of material circumstances that exacerbate divisions and prejudices. There is sufficient goodwill as expressed, for instance, in the gift of the givers, in the spirit of kin demonstrated in individual and in some instances, group relationships across race. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ndabizeta, for that uh, awakening discussion on a very deep issue of social cohesion, which on the face of it is not as straightforward as it may seem. Uh, as in South Africa, we are indeed uh, racially divided and uh, uh, the reasons behind that are many. You cannot just point one of them. So uh, there's a lot that needs to go to be done in order to achieve true social cohesion. But what I'm gathering from what Prof is saying is that uh, currently though there is a will to achieve social cohesion, but the way that you are going about it, it, uh, it uh, it's in doubt whether it will achieve the desired aim. Uh, but without taking much of our time, uh, I see that none of the questions have come. Uh, I'll request that Prof Zuru please hang in there. I know the questions will come. Uh, and I'll ask the attendees to please, if you have any question for Professor Zulu, please, type it in the Q and A. Let us now proceed to our next speaker as we are going to address all the, question at the, all the questions at the end. Now our next speak to, speaker comes from the National Prosecutions Authority. She is advocate Roshila Benimadu. Now this speaker is an alumni of this university. She is a senior public prosecutor in the National Prosecutions Authority, and she's based in the Durban Magistrate Court with many years of experience in criminal practice. And she is heading the specialist section at the Durban Court, and that deals with serious and violent criminal syndicate, and uh, also dealing with fraud and anti-corruption cases. Now she will be addressing us on the criminal justice response in light of the unrest that occurred in July. Now the title of her presentation is Protest Action in the Rule of Law, Drawing the Line at Criminality. Uh, Advocate Benimato, I will hand over to you now. Thank you, Prof. 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 Thank you,
you very much, Mr. CPC, and my respectful greetings to everyone. Uh, I also bring greetings from the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in KZN. We want to thank you, KZN, for extending an invitation to our office for sharing our experiences and legal insights on this topic. And of course, from a personal perspective, uh, UKZN is my alma mater. So anything associated with the university, it, it always feels uh, good to be back home. So I'm going to go straight into my presentation. As you said, that the topic is protest action and the rule of law, drawing the line at criminality. Uh, do you mind if I just switch my video off? Um, and yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, All right. So this is the scope that I'm going to be covering during the course of my presentation today. We'll be starting out with a problem statement regarding the unrest and the foundational principles of protest as is understood within the legal fraternity. Uh, we will speak about the NPA's mandate and the rule of law. We will talk a little bit about the expectations of civil society on the NPA. We'll give you an example of the historical management of unrest that we handled during Christmas 4. And uh, because the second um, similar incident was the July 2021 unrest uh, um, in, um, in case of Denmark Houting. Uh, we will give you an overview of the cases and our observations, as well as our challenges, and also how we are dealing with the matters in court. Okay. So unrest and unlawful protest are really a burning issue in South Africa. Well, I guess you could say that literally. Uh, the term protest is really the generic term that we use to describe assembly, demonstrations, or pickets um, that is defined in section 17 of the constitution. So protests have been a phenomenal part of our history that has led to our freedom and democracy in our country. And after 1994, it was firmly entrenched in our constitution, with the courts also fearlessly guarding the right to protest. You will see on the slide, I highlighted two recent decisions where the court had struck down provisions of the Regulations of Gatherings Act, holding in favor of the protesters. As government officials, um, and especially from the NPA as well, we also see protests as a constitutional right to be protected, and protests are also healthy catalysts for change in the ecosystem of our democracy. So the problem really is not lawful protesting, where people protest peacefully and unarmed as the constitution requires. The problem is really the unlawful activity that is associated with the protest action. When your mob violence becomes a bargaining tool against government, or when that violence is also a way of debilitating law enforcement, because realistically, the police cannot be everywhere at the same time, as we saw during Christmas Fall and we saw during the July unrest as well. And all of this conduct really is aimed at rendering government ungovernable. So people protest for a myriad of reasons. We have service delivery protests, protesting for fees, political reasons, and many more turn into unrest. Um, some unrest happens for social reasons and really when you least expect it. Now you'll see that I have highlighted on my screen a picture from the Moses Mabida uh, soccer match a few years ago. Um, I hope you know Kaiser Chiefs fans here, but Kaiser Chiefs lost. And the majority of the crowd went absolutely ballistic on a total rampage, destroying infrastructure, looting equipment right down to cutlery. And in this particular picture, it was quite aggravating because they were assaulting a security officer with a chair. So the conduct in under situations uh, really it can be quite extensive. But usually we will find the type of conduct would be um, setting alight essential infrastructure, for example, electrical substations, buses, police vehicles, burning off tires and thereby blockading the major supply route, assault and intimidation of people who don't want to protest. This is a very important part of the um, civic uh, morality and the unrest um, mentality. And then there's the use of weapons and uh, illegal and legal firearms that will weaken the police. Um, 
and dumping of human waste as well, we have seen, and also assault on police. Now, during the fees must fall, there was quite extensive uh, acts of assault on police where the police were being attacked by um, slingshots and stones and rocks and, and literally anything that was in front of the students at the time. Uh, and this was also quite aggravating in terms of you know, the, the um, rule of law and the blatant disregard for the power of law enforcement. Right, so this really is where the work of the NPA now begins, when you have an unrest situation and you have people committing crime. And from the NPA's uh, foundational aspects, we are a creature of statute. We are empowered by Section 179 of the Constitution. And in terms of Section 20 of the National Prosecuting Authority Act, we are mandated to institute and conduct criminal proceedings on behalf of the state. It is therefore our constitutional duty in society to uphold the rule of law and to prosecute those who offend the law and to do so fearlessly. And if we did not, in society's eyes, we would be failing in our duty. Now, if you look at the slide on the left, and now we're talking about the rule of law, uh, the slide on the left will grab uh, your attention as legal people as the perhaps the classic textbook definition of the rule of law. But when you're a practicing uh, attorney, uh, or in my case, uh, prosecuting in the public service, what does the rule of law, rule of law really mean for the people that we serve? And for the ordinary citizens of the country who do not know legal concepts like separation of powers, the rule of law means that people must obey the law. And if they commit a crime, then there must be consequences. Although others must be deterred because of the consequences. Because the majority of the people in our country, wrong is wrong, right is right. And for them, retribution and deterrence are of must most important even in their interaction with each other. And then of course that brings us to rights and responsibilities. Now from the NPA's perspective, civil society is all about rights and duties. In order for the NPA to uphold your right to protest, you must uphold your simultaneous duty or your responsibility to ensure that you do no harm to others while you are exercising your right. And this is really as simple as it gets. And this is because society is founded on the social contract of mutual respect and regard for each other's rights. And while you may have the right to protest, there are also other recognized rights, like the right to life, the right to freedom and security of the person, and the right to property. And protesters always need to understand is that protest rights are not absolute or non-derogable, and they may be limited. So in terms of your general unrest uh, circumstances, the general prosecuting prosecutorial framework for the drafting of our charges, in terms of statutory law, we have a range of statutes. Um, I've listed them on my slide, so I'm not going to go into them. And on the right-hand side, we have the common law offenses as well. Now, in terms of our relationship with civil society and the NPA, as the NPA, we understand that the concerns that civil society have are one, is an alarming increase in civil unrest in our country. Two, is an alarming degree of increased criminality and violence involved in that unrest. Three, people lack confidence that people who get arrested are not prosecuted. And four, if people are in fact convicted, they get trivial sentences, which serves as little deterrent to the general populace who do engage in criminal misconduct. So we will be addressing the management of the unrest cases um, in our courts. But from the NPA's perspective as, as well, violent protests are a reporting area for the NPA in terms of our strategic planning. And we do maintain a database of matters. We review our cases, we evaluate our convictions, we have a look at the reasons for the withdrawals or why the matters are not being placed in role. So whenever these unrest matters come to court, they're just not dealt with in a uh, functory fashion. 
we do actually try to understand the dynamics of that particular unrest and work progressively towards uh, finalizing the matters. Now, I wanted to talk about the historical management of, of unrest cases. And I thought that we talk about something that's quite close to home and that's fees must fall. Because the recent years were really violent times in tertiary history. And for those of us who journeyed with us during this time, we'll, we'll get goosebumps thinking about the level of violence and destruction that young people in society were capable of. And you will not know that at that time, after fees must fall started, School kids in their schools went on rampages and even burned schools and school property in support of Fees Must Fall. And I'm also fully aware of the intimidation on students and lecturers during this time as well. And the NPA also went through turbulent times in doing our jobs to uphold the rule of law. We were threatened directly and indirectly, that is the prosecutors who were dealing with the matters. We were jeered at in court and outside court when we were leaving the building to go home or when we were coming to work. We were mocked at, even ridiculed by the legal fraternity, some members who told us that we were resorting to an authoritarian state because we were prosecuting students. Um, students brazenly came to court wearing slingshots around their necks. It was really the fearless and zero tolerance approach that we took that eventually brought the students to their senses to stop that senseless violence and destruction because students realized that we were not going to withdraw the charges and where in the interest of justice, bail was opposed and was upheld on appeal as well. And many of the students were prosecuted and convicted because of the rule of law. So coming to July, 2021 and those three fateful days um, in our country, you know, the media reports uh, or media has reported that this round of unrest in July, uh, which brings us here today, is really the worst since 1994. And I'm not going to repeat all that we saw and read in the media, except to add that my team and I did site inspections of some of these areas. And what was reported in the media was nothing compared to the actual loss and destruction of property on the ground. And it was really scorched earth behavior that we are increasingly seeing in terms of unrest behavior. Break in, steal, damage, earn, and leave nothing in your wake. The reality you. is... You have about five minutes. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Right, so coming to the dockets that we are dealing with, uh, we have made some observations which we think will be important to the audience. One, that the looting was targeted and there were specific individuals that were behind that were planning and inciting the violence. We found that it was highly organized and pre-planned, and these are important for, for, for the legal fraternity to understand, that the main breaking ends and the burning was done late at night or early in the mornings, so that was making detection of perpetrators quite difficult. And in almost all the areas and stores where there were CCTV cameras, the security rooms were broken into and the BBR recorders were stolen. And I've never seen this in any unrest situation before, which goes to show the level of premeditation. And for the high-end stores and businesses, the trucks and vans were immediately on the scenes to cart away the goods. And in some of the businesses that were looted and burned, you can't get there on foot. You have to get there by vehicle, which just shows that there was pre-arranged transport for the perpetrators. This was just to show you the vehicles that were involved. So what was important is that um, there, there was the... Um, the submissions that were made on the media, that the accused were from poverty backgrounds. But we did not find that in our uh, assessment of the dockets because we, the social media reports, the Woolworths and his, the Woolworths looter in his Mercedes Benz. There was a CEO from a wealth management company as well that had loot in his Jeep vehicle. We had ex counselors uh, with unlicensed firearms, etc. So at the end of the day, uh, it was reported that the underlying factors was poverty, inequality, and, and unemployment. And that is not our experience. And we cannot blame the poor only as every class benefited. All right, so these were the charges that we have preferred um, against most of the matters in our courts. 
And from an ecosystem point of view, uh, you know, we have a system of prosecutor guided investigations whereby, uh, you know, the prosecutors take a dominant role in terms of what evidence is required and then guide the um, investigating officers regarding the admissibility. We have a multi-level um, management of cases as well, whereby the various cases from the in the unrest uh, from July are being dealt with by prosecutors and organized crime unit, regional courts and district courts, depending on the severity of the cases and the evidence. And then we also have um, brought the asset forfeiture unit on board as well, because a lot of people benefited from this. Right. Um, obviously, the aggravating factors in terms of the unrest was that it was during level three of COVID management. Um, a lot of the vaccines and scheduled medicines were looted as well. These are essential services that impacted directly on, uh, you know, especially the elderly and, and the young and the overwhelming um, impact on the business community, which has not yet been quantified. Now, in terms of my closing comments, okay. I, I agree uh, uh, with some of the sentiments that uh, Professor Zulu has made, um, um, especially in his in his closing comments as well, where, whereby I also say that the unrest leaves huge question marks on the levels of civic um, and moral responsibility and regard for the rule of law. And the scary part is that it's just a minority that has the ability to hold the majority ransom through acts of serious criminality. And uh, what we did see from an enforcement perspective is that majority of civil society sought to uphold law and order and protect the communities from disaster. And when the police services were stretched thin, it was the community policing forums, private security and citizens, they all joined hands to create that larger protection on shops and malls in communities. I mean, for example, um, some members of the taxi industry took a strong, a strong stand against the looters and stood off in many of the areas protecting those businesses and the looters were forced to retreat. So what society wants from society themselves and from the NPA is retribution and to see that justice is being done. And that is will be inherent in, in the series of prosecutions that we have embarked upon. Um, they want to see us fearless and strong in executing our mandates so that the rule of law is upheld. And more importantly, um, and tying in with what Professor Zulu has said as well, is that from a social cohesion point of view, we really need to move towards more behavior changes in society. And perhaps that is something that this forum is, is going to discuss and take forward. Thank you, Mr. Sabisi. Thank you, Advocate uh, Benimatu, for that. Uh, address. Uh, I remember myself when I was at the Deben Magistrates Court around uh, the Fismas Fall uh, protests. Well, the fortunate part is that I was on the defense side. <laughs> so uh, I, re I received letter less of the threats from legal aid. So I, I felt for you guys. Of course, when about 150 students were arrested on uh, the same day, it was a hectic day uh, because every court was busy with such matters. And uh, you ask yourself about convictions because you know very well that if too many people are arrested around the same time, there is a good chance that uh, in a crime, in the sense that when it comes to proving the guilt of a particular accused, you know, arresting officer, or anyone who's a key witness may have a difficult time saying what how each person each person participated in the commission of the crime. Uh, fortunately, with the, uh, the 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 looting incidents, we do have uh, video incidents to assist some of uh, those who are key in assisting the prosecution in securing a conviction. Uh, colleague, colleagues and attendees, I'd like to remind you once again that. Uh, Professor Penimato and Professor Zuto, Advocate Penimato, I think uh, one day you will be a professor, uh, Advocate. Uh, professor Zuri and Advocate Penimato are still around and uh, uh, questions are still welcome if you have questions for each of the speakers and I uh, also encourage you to specify. Uh, our last speaker is a man who is internal to the UKZN who doesn't need much introduction. 
He is a lecturer at UKZN. He lectures in international law and international criminal law. He will address us from an international perspective uh, and linking it to the July unrest. Chris. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as the Chair said, my name is Christopher, and I'm going to be trying to bring to bear on these difficult questions the frame of international law and international criminal law. Um, and what I want to suggest is that that's not only a useful frame for what it does in terms of bringing together the questions of criminal justice and social cohesion into one frame, but it's necessary for the purposes of properly understanding the causes of that violence and dealing with um, the violence in all its forms. And in fact, the MPA is under an obligation to do so in some respects uh, when these criminal incidents rise to the level of crimes against humanity. So let me begin by just saying quickly why I think this is a useful frame and a necessary frame. So there's two features really of international criminal law or certainly crimes against humanity like apartheid um, that set them apart perhaps from what we've been discussing so far. So the first is that international criminal law and crimes against humanity are particularly concerned with inhuman acts most especially inhuman acts that lead to the loss of life um, and other forms of severe suffering and deprivation of human rights. And historically, given where they come from in terms of the Nuremberg prosecutions and the apartheid convention, they were interested in particular with these acts when they're connected to racial domination or racial motivation. Right? So the first reason why this is an important frame is because it brings us squarely to the question of this is a mass casualty event. But we have to come to terms as a society, both socially and legally and criminally, with the, just the high number of people who were killed um, during the unrest. And I must register my concern that I didn't see on the NPA slides a reference to the, to the human toll of, of the protests. Um, and I think we have to do that not just because it's simply um, a remarkably high number of deaths. If we think about it in relation to, it's far more than the Sharpeville massacre, but some estimations it's as many as the Soweto uprising. So in the history of it, it's far more than the Americana massacre as well. So we have to come to terms both as a question of law and as a social question, and possibly as a question of criminal law, the severely high number of deaths, and also the fact that an overwhelming majority of those deaths were people who were black and poor. And that's something that certainly international criminal law would place front and center when we think about this as a crime against humanity. So the second thing we have to, or the second reason why this is an important framing, at least not from the question of legal obligation, but just coming to terms with the nature of this as a mass casualty event or as, a, as an act of, of violence at a social level is because international criminal law understands crimes in particular through the notion of systematicity. So international crimes are, are defined as, these crimes against humanity are defined as crimes that are widespread and systematic. So international criminal law has both historically and theoretically come to, to, to develop techniques to understand mass structural systemic crimes and systemic forms of, of violation. And in particular, I'll come to this at the end, forms of violation um, that amount to the crime of apartheid. So for example, to be very practical, when international crimes are prosecuted at the International Criminal Court, the court looks for, for the telltale signs that the crime was either systematic in its nature, so carried out in a highly organized fashion, or widespread in its, in its effects in terms of its impact on, on individuals. So for example, when prosecuting crimes committed in post-election uh, Kenya in 2008, one of the things that the prosecutor was interested in was the, the use of cell phones to communicate um, the plans for attack, to communicate threats of attack, to communicate the intention to attack or to incite certain attacks as well. And so I think there's very much, there's actually directly relevant international jurisprudence um, in relation to this as a systematic crime. So I think if we hold those two things together, if we, if we bring our focus, I think as we must, not just morally, politically, socially, but, but legally on the inhuman acts that are implicated in this violence and, and the high death toll, um, both from direct and indirect acts of violence, and also we hold together this frame of systematicity, then international criminal law, and particularly the crime against humanity of apartheid, has much um, fruit to bear in respect of how we understand these events. And I say that in, in, in two respects. So the first is that there is, there is evidence, I believe, in the public record, that there were direct acts of violence that were committed on the basis of race in an organized and systematic way, um, both the ones that have already been mentioned, but also other acts as well. And so not just violence in terms of acts of murder or causing severe deprivation of human rights, 
Um, but even the, the denial of access to certain residential areas, if that denial was based on race um, or other recognized protected grounds, that would be a crime of persecution. If it was organized systematically and, and was widespread, or certainly systematically in terms of how it was carried out through technology, that may well amount to a crime against humanity of persecution as well. And it's important here to register that at this point, when we can characterize these as international crimes, in particular the crime against humanity of murder, um, to the extent that these were systematically planned and carried out, um, and the crime against humanity of persecution, if they were done so on the basis of race, then that elevates the usefulness of this frame, because as our constitutional court has said on numerous occasions, and the NPA will be well aware of this, that there's an obligation on the NPA to investigate and prosecute crimes against humanity, particularly ones committed in South Africa, but even ones committed abroad. And we've celebrated, and civil society have celebrated, when we utilize this type of um, mechanism to investigate crimes committed, for example, in Zimbabwe, and we need to be as vigilant in terms of how we hold the NPA and the state to account, to exercise or to fulfill its obligations when these crimes are committed domestically. So that's the first direct, I think, outcome of the framing of this through the lens of international criminal law. But the second one, I think, is one that comes towards the question of social cohesion and some of the points made by Prof Sulu. And it's important in this regard, I want to extend what Prof Sulu said, which I thought was very powerful, is to think of social cohesion as not just an event, it's not even just a policy. The lack of social cohesion is the afterlife of the crime against humanity that was apartheid that took place in this country, at least from 1948 onwards and arguably before. Right? So social cohesion is not the same as it is in other countries, it's not a project, it's not a buzzword, when we talk about the fault lines that emerged in July, those fault lines are the aftermath of a crime. And I would argue, in fact, a continuing crime. If we think about apartheid as a system like so many systems of domination that can survive its formal abolition, well, then in some senses, we might still be in a state of acts of criminal apartheid being committed by private individuals on the grounds not just of direct violence, but indirect violence. And to come to terms with this, we have to reach a little bit beyond the typical toolbox, um, but not too far, at least not far from home, to the Apartheid Convention itself. So when we think about uh, the Apartheid Convention, it's a convention that's a subject of a lot of misinformation and misdirection, particularly in the South African context. The Apartheid Convention was a recognition that South Africa was uh, the crime against humanity um, of apartheid, sorry, South Africa was committing the crime against humanity of apartheid, but also was a framework for dealing with both the prosecution of that crime and the suppression of that crime. And what makes this framework so important, and perhaps the reason that it so often gets cast, or cast to the side, is it has an inconvenient commitment to understanding violence as structural, to understanding the effects of apartheid, apartheid as going beyond individual bad apples or individual acts of direct violence, but to include the structures that were put in place and left behind um, when apartheid fell. But so the, the crime against humanity of apartheid as understood by the apartheid convention includes both the direct acts of violence and persecution I've mentioned, but also preventing racial groups from participating in the political, social, economic, and cultural life of a nation through any means. Right? So when we think about those afterlives, those structures of apartheid, those economic and spatial and other structures that, that Prof. Zulu has so ably set out as, um, I think, you, I forget the precise formulation, but as sort of the predisposing conditions for this crime, these are the, these are the afterlives of a crime. These are not predisposing in the sense that they don't have an existence before this moment. They are in fact left behind by the crime against humanity of apartheid. And that's important, not just because we need to think about this from the level of prosecuting anyone who manifests or supports or aids and abets the continuation of those structures, but we also have to think about the obligation on the state and society to suppress apartheid, to address the ongoing acts um, of apartheid or other forms of segregation, both in terms of the government's responsibilities to investigate and prosecute and to, to address the problems of social cohesion that can be traced back to the crime against humanity of apartheid. Also in terms of the reparations directly owed to victims of apartheid, and we've seen in the last couple of weeks that, that victims of apartheid are still um, asking for assistance and demanding assistance as their right, as per the recommendation of the, truth of the TRC. But also that the obligation is on all of us um, to directly think about how to address the structural causes of both the, the July unrest, but to see those as an afterlife of apartheid is to think of us as all at the scene in some senses of a crime. And we need to think about how we marshal not just our civic energies, as, as Prof. Zulu has said, but also our intellectual energies to try to come to terms with the fact um, that this was an event of 
tremendous human suffering um, for which we can point fingers in some instances and say we can recognize this as a crime. But how do we come to terms with the more difficult uh, aspects of us, the structural drivers, um, and whether or not we understand those as being framed criminally or framed in, in terms of social interventions, we have to center them in terms of the loss of life that is incurred and center them in terms of them being an afterlife of the crime against humanity of apartheid, which to, to paraphrase the Nuremberg Tribunal was a crime that contained the accumulated evil of the whole. Thanks, Chair. Uh, th thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris, for your address. Uh, you, 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 you are truly committed to the ideals of the UKZN for keeping to the time. <laughs> uh, I, I must say that we are still listening and uh, yeah, that's captured and uh, in the true fashion of an experienced speaker who will leave his audience at the time they are just glued all into him so that they're expecting more next time they meet again. Uh, uh, thank you to all the speakers. I believe now we will be doing the Q&A. Uh, so far, we have not received so much questions, but uh, there is one which uh, came through the Q&A. It's not so much a question as such, but for the benefit of everyone, I will try to read it. I believe perhaps it uh, uh, requires uh, uh, Prof. Zulu to comment on it per se because I, I couldn't find the question aspect. But it uh, says to Prof. Zulu, uh, lawyers in courts, they argue that rules of natu natural justice dictate that if you have done something uh, deviant from the norm, I believe wrong, uh, uh, there is a situation or a principle uh, in terms of that says that on good cause shown, your actions may be justified. Uh, my emphasis. I am asking this because the narrative of Phoenix does not tell us what would have been what would have been the better alternative intervention to prevent the looting day, because access to Phoenix is open. At Clement. Black shops were also looted at Amman's Mdoti. Whites were carrying firearms uh, to protect Scalaria and Man's Mdoti Mall and Dunsan. Fortunately, they killed nobody because their entrance are well identified with fences in their area. So, Prof. Zulu, I think the question is what could have been done in the Phoenix situation since uh, it's open? Yeah. If you take a walk through Phoenix within a few minutes, you enter another community that is predominantly or only black. So I believe it's, that is the main question. Prof. Zul. Yeah, I, I think the issue starts at literally why had there to be self-defense units organized at all. Uh, from the social cohesion perspective, it is, here is a group of looters who belong to another clan. If I were to use my analogy of primordial affiliations, here is a group of looters who belong to another clan going into another clan to invade the stock. Looters come from a clan that doesn't own. They are invading the stock of a clan that purportedly owns. What does the clan that purportedly own do? Do they sit and fold their hands and say, brothers have come to visit us? Or do they protect their property? And in the process of the protecting of the property, what happens? That's the first approach to the issue. The second approach is, why were the invaders coming from a different clan? And this is where the apartheid special planning comes into it. 
I don't think there's an easy answer. Galeria and the other places were not looted because there was an understanding that the clan behind the walls was well prepared to defend the property. And there probably was an understanding that the clan behind Phoenix, which does not have walls, was not that powerful to defend the property. And this goes back again to why do we have a country that is configured in such a way that these divisions are so easy to identify and manipulate? Yeah, that's my response. Thank you, Prof. Uh, there is another question coming from one of the attendees. It says, Dabezita, what is your view with regard to racial screening that took place during the unrest, looking at the history of our country? I don't think I have a view. I think you are, what the question should be, what were the realities of the looting? Again, the, the, the mistrust that I spoke about, the classification of certain, not necessarily an official classification, the classification or the perception in the minds of people that blacks were looters, which in essence, the people that looted were black, but was every black a looter? I think this is where we should direct our question. Was every black person a looter? or black persons looted. I think we also don't have to run away from the realities. There were, and if black persons looted, need every black person have been screened to demonstrate that he's not a looter? That's my response. Thank you, Prof. Zulu. I see one of our panelists, Chris Shiva, says he's end up. Uh, Chris? Thanks, Chair. So I, I just wanted to build on the, on the response from Prof. Zulu about the question of, of why these spatial divisions were there in the first place. And also to, to put into that conversation, not just what, why they were there, but why they're still there, right? So, so the institution of this certainly was a project at the state level of spatial planning. It's continuation we might address at various levels. You might say it's continuation is because what Prof. also calls, well, because of what Prof. also calls the constitutionalization of injustice, that property rights were constitutionalized, and that's the injustices, including the spatial injustices of apartheid were frozen in law. But at a more direct level, this continuation happens because it's policed, right? It's policed and most often invisibly policed by questions of private security or private property or defense, but sometimes very obviously publicly policed by barricades. Um, and to the extent that that involved racial screening or just the policing of space on the basis of race, uh, that would be a persecution as a crime against humanity uh, to the extent that it was uh, systematic and carried out uh, with a discriminatory intent. But the Apartheid Convention says that the crimes of apartheid include uh, denial of freedom of movement and residence. So to the extent that that amounts to the persecution for the purposes of maintaining domination or white supremacy specifically, then it might well amount to a crime of apartheid. So I think what, what helps us, what we need to have in mind is not just, and I think that's why the language of an afterlife is, is problematic in some senses and helpful, is that this is not an architecture that lies decaying. It's an architecture that is reinforced um, every day through, through, the, through the law but sometimes quite visibly enforced to the violence of private citizens. 
And the visible, I would argue that the former needs to be addressed, but even at the very least, the latter, the idea that private citizens can enforce these spatial demarcations and do so on the basis of race is a crime against humanity. And we should call it nothing less. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, there is another question that appears to be directed to Prof and the advocate. Uh, uh, it, it, it's coming from Domfigile Mazibogo. It says, it seems quite easy for our society to explain violence and unacceptable behavior in racial factors. How do we sensitize ourselves to critical analysis on matters of morality, responsible citizenry, and non-violent, but effective engagement with government? So, uh, uh, advocate. Thank you, Mr. Zabisi. Thank you, Ms. Mazibuko. Um, I just want to understand your question because I don't think any of uh, the speakers had indicated that civil disobedience is particularly a racial um, issue uh, or that we explain civil um, or we argued civil dis disobedience to be part of a particular race. Uh, we were basically discussing the unrest in this particular context. So if I understand your question, you basically want to know how else can um, society explain, be able to explain or explore their protest rights other than resorting to violence. And uh, we as the NPA would say that, you know, as from a society's perspective, you have to look at the different mechanisms. There are various mechanisms that are available in society in, that you can associate with in order to move these, um, these thoughts and views. For example, um, you have your pressure groups, you have political organizations, you have social organizations, various movements, religious um, organizations as well, that can all contribute towards good, responsible citizenry and um, engagement with government on issues that are, you know, in, that are burning issues to society. Thank you, Advocate. Uh, if I may move on to another question. It says, well, according to your opinion, Honorable Speaker, I'm not sure which speaker is being referred to, but hopefully we'll find out. And based on your previous statement in your discussion with regard to the looting case in South Africa, do you think the current leading government of that time since we are coming from an election of our new leadership recently. So we have a new leadership now, but let's ignore the fact that our focus and attention is upon the incident of looting in South Africa. If the government is liable to be blamed as a result of that incident, or the blame shall be upon the misbehaviors of our people. If so, poverty still remains our big debate and it is impossible for us to point any achievement of the national development plan from the present ruling government, meaning they are failing the majority for, for, forefront, key agendas of our NDP, as well as the SDG and MDGs. I, 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 it would have been better if this acronym has been stated in full first, like uh, the NDP. Uh, which you know is the National Development Plan. Uh, but hopefully the person who asked the question will come in to clarify. Uh, Prof. Zul, I believe this question is yours. To start with, I, I'm not even sure if I understand the question pretty well. If I were to summarize it, does it say, because issues of poverty and poor governments continue, how do we manage looting? Am I sort of paraphrasing that well? It's a very, very it, long It's question. a very complex question. It raises very, from the way I see it, 
it seems to be referring to uh, us or the government not meeting the projections of the National Development Plan. Uh, one of them is to eradicate poverty. So poverty is still there. Uh, so it appears to be along uh, those lines. I think the, the, the problem in South Africa is that we've, we've become a nation of slogans. Number one, poverty does not make people loot. It might make them recruitable or take an opportunity to loot. But it's the looting is a decision by an individual whether you join the mob or you do not join the mob. Whether you create conditions that make the mob possible, it's a, it's a governmental and a societal issue. I, I just don't think this is a question that can be, if the question is what we understand it to be, that can be answered just in one line and in one question. There are quite a number of issues. First of all, in my paper, I re referred to the predisposing factors, but it was with regard to why the reaction in Phoenix was, took the course it did. This question would refer to why people in general looters took the course they did and why they looted at all. And that's a, 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 an issue for a different discussion altogether. A weakness in the state's capacity to provide for services, a weakness in the state capacity to provide mechanisms for the rule of law, and in the final analysis, as I did say, the violence was highly organized because of the factions in the ruling party. And I think that's where our starting point will be. And then someone might say, why did society respond the way they responded? And that's where we come to issues of poverty and the others as mediating factors and not as causal factors. Going right through to the issue of morality. Why were we so susceptible to looting and destruction? It's quite a very lengthy question. I don't think I can respond to it adequately and accepting in chunks. And those chunks would have to be presented by the questioner. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, there is another question. It's unfortunately, it came through the chat platform, uh, but um, the, the, the student is basically asking about what appears to be uh, some of the crimes going unpunished. Uh, and perhaps to place a question of this nature in context, like in the looting situation, if advocate, you could uh, advise us of some of uh, uh, the difficulties that the prosecution may have in securing convictions, uh, because there appears to be that uh, perception that uh, 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 some people are never convicted for, for their crimes and so on. Uh, we are yet to hear of a high profile conviction flowing from the July uh, uh, looting and unrest. Uh, we did hear of high profile arrests, but we haven't heard of any uh, 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 successful prosecution uh, uh, so far. So I understand it's been say a few months uh, to expect a conviction, but if you could address us on some of uh, the difficulties that you foresee in securing convictions uh, flowing from the July unrest. Advocate. 
Thank you, Mr. Sabisi. Um, when I last checked, uh, sorry, I just want to open up my phone because I do have some statistics, if you can just bear with me. Um, in terms of our KZN stats, for example, right? And these are not things that we necessarily uh, put out there on the media as yet. Uh, in KZN, for example, we had um, 2,219 dockets to court as at August 2021, right? And by the, uh, I think this was last month, we had 175 people uh, or matters that were finalized uh, where the accused were sentenced, uh, uh, convicted and sentenced. There were 16 who were found not guilty and there were 64 cases that were not placed on roll. So, um, we may not report on all our convictions in the media, uh, but justice system is definitely moving in terms of finalization of these cases. To come to your question regarding the challenges that we have, and I do, I know that you have made reference uh, to some of the high profile matters, which because they are subjudicate, I cannot go into details regarding them at this point uh, until they have been finalized. But the one of the biggest challenges that we have is, uh, in, especially in an unread situation, is for evidence gathering. Because the police will usually be your eyewitnesses to the matter. The scene will usually not have other civilians around, or even if there are other civil civilians around, we would not know who they are. But you would find that because the police are so preoccupied with the crowd management at that scene, that it is impossible for them to, uh, and, and they're stretched so thin in terms of resources, that it is impossible for them to affect the number of arrests that we would like, or even at that point to gather the sufficient evidence that will be required for that particular prosecution. Any successful prosecution depends on evidence and good quality evidence having a high evidential weight. Um, then we spoke about witnesses, and this again comes back to your sense of civic responsibility, um, where the NPA does have a huge problem with witnesses uh, coming forward to testify. And uh, we, we found that even with the Andrea situation, that uh, the police were getting a lot of leads from the community as to where the looted property was, especially the high-end products. Those people wouldn't want to come forward for, um, for fear of... Um, uh, you know, being targeted in the community. So that is another issue that we have in respect of our evidence gathering and witnesses not necessarily being recalcitrant, but actually having that fear that uh, there's going to be some recourse in the community should they be found out that they are the ones who were actually told to the police. And uh, well, then from the evidence gathering stage, we spoke about some of the complications from the July unrest area in terms of our video footage. In some of the bigger looting areas, we found that uh, the DVRs had been deliberately taken away. And um, so the, the state at this point, and I can tell you for the matters that we're dealing with within the Durban court at the moment, we are relying a lot on cell phone evidence we extending our investigations into uh, vehicle tracker records, for example, as well, to link the accused back to their particular offenses. So the whole question of cases coming to court and evidence gathering, it's a very dynamic uh, uh, area. And uh, each case will really be on its own merits in terms of the investigations. The status of the investigations, um, the status of the dockets so far is most of the dockets are now reaching the end of the investigative stage in the criminal process. And um, shortly the pretrial processes are going to start. So there's still time for the case to uh, live out its lifespan in, in the criminal justice process. I hope that answers your question, Mr. Sabisi. Yes, uh, th th thank you, thank you, advocate. Just a, a short one. You mentioned a number of uh, convictions. Those convictions were day convictions uh, following admission of guilt, as I'd I would imagine that there will be a lot of admission of guilt or following a plea 
or was it a full blown trial? And uh, well, I understand that uh, the, the distinct the, the, the acquittals for, 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 for regarding the convictions following a trial or just admission of guilt or a plea. And these are our provincial stats, uh, Mr. Sabisi, and I don't have that particular breakdown as to whether there were plea trials or uh, full-blown trials. But from the convictions that we have so far, I mean, the acquittal, 16 acquittals, I can tell you that some of the trials have already started in other parts of the country. It just depends on the, you know, the extent of the evidence that is required for that particular docket and how long it can take to be set down to trial. Still a question for you, advocate. Mm. Uh, it says looting requires a definition. It says we shouldn't take it as a given. Systemic dispossession by large firms such as Stenhoff, et cetera, goes unpunished. This is not to condone any looting, but a disproportionate alarm against events mid-July abhorrent as they were versus the ongoing slow and vicious systemic looting in this country, uh, which requires careful examination. I would like a response from the NPA advocates in particular. Yeah, um, yeah, Mr. Sabisi, I'm not sure if that's really a question uh, or it's more of a comment that the person is making in terms of the person's perspective and opinion on you know, the, the different types of crimes that are, that are continuing simultaneously in our country. So I, I am aware of the, uh, the Steinhoff matter and that large scale fraud, uh, which hasn't yet come to court. And then on the other hand, you have the looting cases where the people are being charged with theft, malicious individual property, et cetera, where there's direct evidence, uh, you know, it's uh, uncomplicated if there's a direct eyewitness. I'm not really sure how to answer that question there. I think it's more for a comment and a perspective. I, I, I also think so too. There's another question that says, advocate, in the aftermath of violence in instances like the FISMAS fall and the looting this year, which are politically charged, how much of a political influence or presence is there where the NPA upholds the rule of law through the due process of prosecution? So mm -hmm. to what extent is there any political influence? Um, I will speak for myself personally in this matter, uh, from my experience with Peace Must Fall as well. It was very politically charged at that time. I can tell you that there was not a single political party that had approached the NPA uh, with the view of how the matter should be dealt with. So, you know, I, I, it's difficult to examine the, APA, uh, the NPA because there's so many things that's going on at the same time. In terms of the matters that I have dealt with and the matters that we are dealing with in the courts relating to these unrest, um, I have not experienced any particular, uh, any political interference. And remember at the end of the day, a prosecutor has to apply themselves to the evidence in the docket. It doesn't matter what one party feels or doesn't feel. At the end of the day, the evidence is either there or it is not there. And the prosecutor's allegiance is to the docket, to the rule of law, and placing that evidence before court. Uh, thank you, Advocate. I believe Chris gave us also wants to add regarding defining definition of looting, I assume. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I was actually going to address a, a separate question, Chair, if that's okay. So All right. the question that came through from Anonymous about why were the people defending the neighborhoods and shops called vigilantes? So the simple answer is that's a definition of vig vigilante, right? To take up the law into your own hands, the definition of a, vig of a vig vigilante, which is why we call them that. Um, and to do so is a violation of the rule of law, which we like to tout so much, right? To take the law into your own hands is a violation of, a, of the rule of law, only excusable in, ex in, in, in particular circumstances that are unique um, and quite rare. But I think more importantly, the question addresses itself to why were those who us, and I'm not sure who us were in the question, why we've been vilified when we're genuine defenders. And I think that's precisely the problem. So I'm not sure who the us is, but I'm gonna assume that the us is in the, in the suburbs. So I'm not aware of any example of 
someone in a suburb being directly attacked or physically assaulted or worse um, as described. So raped, robbed and possibly killed. Um, if that's something that happened, I'd be, I'd be happy to have that information. But as far as I understand, the attacks were directed against property. Um, but the attacks that, that were directed by so-called defending groups were sometimes directed against human beings. Um, and I think we have to make that distinction clear and hold on to it. And here again, I think it's useful to think about the, the, the international criminal law experience. So, so often when I'm reading cases about international crimes, we have these things called popular defense militias or defenders groups or safety groups, or that in, in many senses, when you have uh, people take the law into their own hands, it's not a long step until you have forms of vigilantism. And in societies like ours, which is, as has been set out and is unavoidable, are changes we structured along um, various fault lines that can be can lead to further violence. So it's precisely if we're going to have a response that says we're going to defend the rule of law, defending rule of law includes defending those who would take up arms to defend um, their property. Um, I don't accept that people were defending, or at least I'm not aware of, of, of any evidence to, to support the claim people were defending themselves from being killed and, and, and um, sexually assaulted in suburbs. But defending property, taking up arms is a, a violation of the rule of law. Um, it should be dealt with as such. And as I've said, to the extent that it took the form of, as what you say, um, a couple of racists, well, those couple of racists, to the extent that they did that defense on the grounds of race, would be committing a crime against humanity of persecution. So would anyone who participated in that crime by sharing those types of stories or by sharing information about those stories um, by circulating information about where people were for the purposes of ensuring that they were somehow abused, not just directly, but even in terms of policing of boundaries of, of suburbs on the basis of race. All of this would amount to a crime of persecution to the extent that people's rights were violated. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's something that we can't get away from and we shouldn't get away from in our conversations by directing all our attention to the effects on property. Thanks, Jay. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, there is another question from Mzamokoza that is directed to uh, Prof Zulu. Uh, well, it's quite a, a tricky one because it's asking you <laughs> to tell him what to make of the situation. So it says that is it's a, the general impression amongst Black communities is that Indians killed Blacks in Phoenix. And, other, and the other general impression is that Indian communities were defending themselves and as their so-called heroes. One, we know that Phoenix was not the only barricaded area and was not the only Indian resident or Indian community in Etewini. Should we say that the Indian community defended themselves and their properties while we know that some innocent people die. So that is the question, Prof. Should we say they defended themselves or in property and ignored the other side of, uh, of people who were not even part of uh, the looting or were just passing by Phoenix who were eventually uh, killed? I think I made it very clear in the presentation in the section that I referred to as the anatomy of Phoenix. And I think anyone can seriously draw for themselves from the narrative what happened. Whether, what, whether you call it self-defense or whether you call it an attack on the properties, another story. Following the Phoenix incident, there was an African peer review group that came through a group in Durban known as the Zubera Research uh, Institute. And I was invited by Zubera as a social scientist to have interactions with the African review group that came. And on visiting Phoenix, they were quite some very moving things that we came across there. We went to a school. It's in an Indian, Indian area. It was formerly an Indian school, but the majority of students now, or of pupils or learners, depending on what you want to call them, 
are African, about 90% of them. There would be about also 90% to 95% of the teachers being Indian, a few Africans there. The principal took us around the school and said the children are not even very keen to eat because of the prejudices that have been spread around. We then spoke to the children and a boy of about 18 said, we've been told at home not to eat, but we, we do want to eat because we are hungry. And we do eat. The teachers have eaten the food in front of us to show that it is not poisoned. And we did not think it would be poisoned in the first instance. I'm just giving you a narrative without conducting any analysis. We did not think it would be poisoned in the first instance. But anyway, having been told at home not to eat, we're very happy when the teachers first ate to demonstrate that the food was not poisoned. We then spoke to the young girls and there was a young Indian girl who burst into tears and said, my friends are across there pointing at the African girls, but they are no longer talking to me and I don't know why. And she burst into tears. We proceeded into the business side of it, came across an Indian guy of about 60 odd years, an owner of a panel beating shop. As I say in the narrative, pointing at the cars that had been destroyed. And he's, he burst into tears also. Immediately, immediately his sons came. If we were not an African, in the African peer review group, unarmed and looking like civilians, they would have molested us, taking into account the anger in their eyes. Just giving you a narrative for you to make up your mind. You are the owner of a penal beating shop. You see it being burned by people who are visible there and you see them and the properties, and you are going to be held liable for the cars, there might be insurance and the other things. Again, make it for, I leave it to you to make a decision as to how you would have acted. I did point out that a number of people who passed through Phoenix were intimidated, if not molested, but I have spoken to a number, and when I really say a number, I mean a number of residents of Phoenix, and none of them was either intimidated or molested in their African people. And I think I was very specific in the presentation that the predisposing factors make suspicions and lack of trust very possible. Yeah, I don't think I want to judge and honestly I mean it and say, if I had been, if people came to where I live and I perceived them to be threatening to destroy my property, I don't know how, how I would have reacted. Whether I would have run away or if I felt I was armed enough, I would have shot at them. I don't know. It has not happened to me. And therefore, to be precise, I don't think I want to judge what happened in Phoenix because I don't have sufficient data on every detailed case to be able to say so. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. I uh, think you, you've you nailed it. Uh, yeah, I I, say. Could I just point out also before the thing, what I have always found irritating in the South African situation, and I really mean it, and probably, probably from an academic standpoint, is the amount of talking we want to do without sufficient data 
and the tendency to pick on the low hanging tree, as I put it. I mean, I deliberately put that passage, the tendency to pick on the low hanging tree without wanting to go into details and having all the data before we conduct an analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Advocate Benimadu. Thank you, Mr. Sabisi. Just for the um, student's benefit, uh, I just want to uh, you know, further explain that July unrest, there's two things that happened. One was the unrest and the subsequent act was the response to that unrest. So there are really two things that are running, seem to be running parallel in this conversation here. Um, the, uh, one of these students referred to vigilantism. And I think uh, my colleague to give us had clarified that aspect of the uh, vigilantism. But I just want to just add on is that um, the community for whatever reason at that point uh, had decided to, to take the security of that particular area into their own hands, their community. And that resulted in several acts of assault and in some cases in death as well. Okay, I just want the students to understand is that those people who are being accused of those acts and those murders as well, they are not beyond or above the rule of law. And they have been charged and they have been appearing in court as well, where the, um, the prosecutors have also taken a very firm stand from stand in respect of the opposition of bail and the evidence gathering. And those particular matters are also following their due process in the court as well. I'm not sure if the students are aware of that. And then uh, just to clarify, uh, further clarify one of the previous comments that was made uh, by one of the students where they asked, you know, what other options are there besides violence? Um, I want to put it out there to the student, um, even about the dangers of um, mob violence and being involved in that mob activity. Uh, you know, especially during this unrest as well, we had seen that um, there, were, there were several deaths that happened as a result of the stampede activity. There were deaths that happened because people were trying to get loot off from higher racks and these were high end products and these washing machines or boxes containing heavy equipment had fell on them, crushing them to death as well. There was also instances whereby people had also consumed alcohol excessively and had passed away at a particular scene. So to go to the question of, um, of uh, violence and what other option there is, the answer is that violence is never the answer. Thank you, Mr. Sabisi. I thank you, Advocate. I had a question coming from an anonymous attendee who is saying, can the speakers speak to the absence of the state within the framework of the law in protecting people and property during the unrest. In other words, is the state complicit in all that was unlawful during the July unrest? Uh, Chris? <laughs> Thanks, Chair. I don't know why they got along with me. Um, I, mean, I mean, in a sense, the state is always complicit in both um, unlawful and lawful conduct, right? So the state is the wheel of violence and has a, in theory, a monopoly over it. Um, whether or not the kind of systemic or the alleged systemic failure of the state in respect of predicting um, and addressing the security, security concerns would amount to a crime, I think that's a, that's a difficult case to make. Whether it would amount to complicity in the form um, of a delict is an interesting question, I guess, for students to think about as well. Um, bearing in mind the way that since 1994, our courts and our, and our laws um, have placed the, have really transformed the law of delicty and the, in particular responsibility of state, of the state to act to protect its citizens um, from, from threats. And so whether or not you could argue that particularly those who lost life or livelihoods 
um, can sue the state on the basis of a, a delictual claim um, for their violation. I think that's an interesting and an open question. Um, I think it would be very difficult, but I, but I think it's it's cognizable in law if you think about um, the duty of the state, in particular the duty of, the, of ministers and police um, looking at cases like Carmichael and Kuhn and others. Okay, where's the minister? But whether or not that complicity amounts to criminal complicity, I think that would be quite difficult um, to support as a crime. Although, and again, I speak as, as, a, as someone who teaches predominantly international criminal law, so perhaps the, the NPA has a different view on that, but I would, I would struggle to think of a crime. Unfortunately, <laughs> the state has the crime of being, if you act against the state, obviously then it could be sedition, but in terms of whether you can prosecute um, or cognize that as a crime, I think that would be difficult. But as a intellectual question, that's an interesting question. I and mean, we can think not just in terms of the, the cases involving government liability for state failures, but also we can think of more recent class actions as well um, that are possible um, drawing on the, the silicosis cases and the Americana cases as well. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, again, posing the same question to advocate uh, Benimato. I know that uh, initially, I think all of us were alarmed when this whole thing started. We hope, we're hoping for immediate, uh, especially police response. And I think for a day and a, and a half or two, it was not forthcoming. Uh, now, advocate uh, being someone who relies heavily on, particularly uh, the SAP as being another part of the state uh, to prove your cases. Uh, now, if they were not uh, forthcoming then, if, they were complicit initially at the start. Well, I do understand that you did indicate that uh, a, a police response uh, in a way wasn't uh, equipped to deal with the situation immediately. Uh, but what can you say to what the speaker is saying? Would you say that part of the state was uh, complicit, not to implicate yourself understanding the nature of the question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sabisi, for understanding the sensitivity of the question, which I think will be better suited to someone from the South African Police Service. I heard my colleague, uh, and uh, you know, he's given some thoughts regarding the delictual aspects regarding that. I, I can only say from a prosecutor's point of view, and uh, for someone who was in the trenches uh, during the entire unrest team as well, is that, the, you know, the entire structure and pre-planning of that particular unrest was to dilute the police efficacy. And, and, and no country, you, you will never go to any country in the world whereby police are at every place at every time to manage these kinds of unrest. And the unrest was very violent and very destructive as well. Now, I'm not quite sure what type of response, uh, you know, that, um, you know, people would have wanted from the police, you know, maybe to like barge in and start, uh, you know, attacking the people, placing them under arrest. But my experience with the police as well is that they also have their own crowd management principles, which are aimed largely at managing the crowd rather than creating a bloodbath. And uh, from my conversations uh, with some of the police officers as well, that one of the reasons why they did not take a, a, a heavy-handed approach um, is because many of the people were armed and you can only imagine opening fire or taking a heavy-handed approach on, on a crowd that's going to lead to even more chaos. So I can understand, I, I definitely would not say that the, you know, the police were complicit in the unlawful. I think that's quite far-reaching. Um, but I, I would say that I think, um, you know, from a prosecutor's point of view, it was very thin in terms of the resources that we had, uh, you know, to manage what was happening. Um, at some stage as well, even, the, uh, you know, the police had run out of fuel, because remember that the purpose of the looting and the and the damage to the infrastructure and the national blocking of the national supply routes and, and blowing up of the cargo trucks was all aimed at destabilizing um, the, the communities. So the communities didn't have fuel, even the prosecutors didn't have fuel to get to work. Uh, we didn't have food as well. You know, we, we were working against all odds, just like every other member of uh, civil society that was affected at that time. But as, as essential services, we needed to get to work. Uh, police needed to get to work. So, you know, um, I think 
the, um, it's important for someone to get all the facts and circumstances regarding a particular matter before we level criticism, uh, you know, and, and make, uh, you know, statements of complicit, uh, being complicit in unlawfulness. Uh, th thank you, advocates. That is uh, quite uh, enlightening uh, because sometimes we, we seem to think that especially police officers, they are just machines that can get anything done anytime and anyhow. Uh, and, and perhaps th this question does relate to uh, Prof Zulu as well as uh, someone who has been you know, at grassroots level. What do the people say was yeah. the Complicit. I, I think what we're, if we are to label or to arrive at complicity at some section of the state, we could probably say, why did state intelligence not pick this up? A, it is very clear that the violence was very well managed and orchestrated. The way they broke into businesses, it would nobody would have left home to go and loot, carrying all the tools to break into a large business or difficult gates as it happened. So somebody was doing that job before that, which means there must have been very clear organization and coordination. And people were just called in as fodder to go and do the destruction. So from that aspect, why did state intelligence not pick this up? Points to some form of complicity and divisions in the state itself. That's what I could say. The other thing is that there were, there were lots of rumors that were flowing around. Again, let's come to the issue of vigilantism and the other things. I live in Gloof. There was word that the looters were coming into Gloof, into the properties, and immediately people formed walls or at the gates, they would be there. How they treated people that entered Gloof, it's a different issue. We had a meeting during the same time, I think it was on the third day of the looting in Glenwood. And we came there and the communities were very well organized. They searched, not the vehicles, but asked people at the gates where you were going to as you went into the gate, or they even wanted to see the boot of the vehicle, what one was carrying. Whether one should say that those were acts of discrimination I don't know. And as again, my, my plea to us as South African citizens would be to try and get as much data on the issues before we make commentary. Yeah, that's all that I can say. Uh, thank, thank you, Prof Zulu. Uh, there is uh, perhaps a comment coming from Mary Dihas. It perhaps links to what you are saying. Uh, she says uh, water cannons should have been used, but most were out of order, which I think speaks to the question of they should have uh, uh, detected it much, much earlier. Had that been the case, I believe there would have been a state of uh, readiness. And she continues to say that uh, soldiers should have been deployed to keep the roads clear immediately, which was the responsibility of the minister. Chris? Thanks, Chair. So I just wanted to come on the points uh, that Prof Zulu made about the difficulty of data in this instance. And I think this is another, another space where it's helpful to focus on the loss of human life because um, in terms of our inquest act, when someone dies and it's not of natural causes, you're supposed to have an inquest and a determination about whether or not uh, that needs to be prosecuted. And so we have in our law these mechanisms that are designed to make sure that, that the loss of any human life doesn't go unremarked um, or, or collected as, as data. And I think so part of the process um, 
and the importance of how we respond to this as Prof. Zulu says, is to have that data. And I think inquest is one way of doing that. Um, we at very least need to have some clarity in terms of numbers and causes of death and, and so on. And I know that there is a, a the Southern Human Rights Commission um, is going to be hearing hearings on, on, on the unrest. And through that, we hope that we'll get um, some more data as well. Thanks, Jack. Yes, I see that we are nearing towards our time limit. Uh, perhaps the question coming from our colleague, uh, Sandy, should be the last question that we field and they see directed to Professor Zulu. It says in the visit, what can we say about the defiance by the Indian community of Phoenix in defending the perpetrators or alleged perpetrators of grievous assault and the matters that took place against uh, uh, the majority of whom were innocent? If the perpetrators are already identified and we're saying the Phoenix community is defiant or protecting them, I think it is as bad as when people get charged and we rush to the courts to give them support. Because it, it's literally saying we are condoning the action that is in space. I think we have a, a democratically elected government with democratic stipulations of how the rule of law applies. And if we have faith in these institutions, then we shouldn't interfere once justice takes its course. Interference is equivalent to condoning what happened. And I think it is bad. And I've put a great if, 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 if then. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Prof. Zulu. Uh, that was uh, the last question. Uh, and we are nearing towards, near, nearing the end. I see that the Dean of the Faculty of Law who was unfortunately not with us at the beginning has joined us. Uh, I don't know if perhaps she will have something to say. Prof. Um, Sirvunga, thank you so much for this opportunity. I must say that you put me a bit on the spot, but I've been thoroughly enjoying everything that I've heard so far. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful to all of the panelists that have presented and to all the participants for their outstanding questions and for making this engagement such a riveting um, discussion and for raising such important issues which have been uppermost in our, in our minds for a long time because what we're talking about is the rule of law and we all understand just how important um, our existence is uh, and the fundamental role that the rule of law plays in, in the kind of life uh, lifestyles that we want to um, enjoy and, and in terms of how we would like our country to emerge and to grow and to prosper. So on behalf of everybody um, in the Navi Pele Research Group, I want to again extend a heartfelt thanks to all of the participants and to our very special panelists. Every one of you has been brilliant. And thank you so much for doing such an outstanding job, um, Sia Bonga as the moderator. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Prof. Uh, in closing, I'd like to also extend our gratitude to uh, the School of Law and the Navi Play Research Interest Group for the support that our attendees and panelists showed not only this week, but as well as uh, last week. Uh, the questions that you posed were very interesting and they spoke to the heart of the various issues that were at play when the July and rest occurred. And a special thanks goes to Prof Zulu, uh, Advocates Benemato and Chris Jivas who agreed to be speakers during this seminar. I know that you guys could have been uh, doing something of your own planning, but you increased this occasion by agreeing to spend so much time, patience, uh, responding to questions, and uh, for that we are indebted. And we'd also like to thank all our students, uh, especially some of the final year students that I see attended, who despite having so many assessments this week, they did take the opportunity 
uh, uh, to come here and, uh, and, uh, and listen and actively participate as well. Uh, and uh, uh, all corporate relations who assisted us, uh, Shika, uh, thank you so much for your assistance. Uh, without you, this session would have taken a different turn. And I see that there's a YouTube link in case anyone is interested uh, to sit down and have a look at what took place before you arrived. You are more than welcome to tune into Zoom. Uh, that is it from myself. Thank you.